Welcome to another episode of Savage Town TV. I'm your host, A.B. Brizzy, and today I have special guest, Power, with me today. How you feeling? I'm feeling good, bro. Appreciate you. No problem, man. Appreciate you coming, blessing the platform. Yes, I see you got the, you got the whole, you got the, you got the hat on and everything. <laughs> Power Restaurant. Fuck with that. Fuck with that. Mm. Um, let's get right into it, man. For the people that don't know, where are you from? I was born in Los Angeles, but we came back to the South when I was three years old. So I was raised between... The Cab County, Rockdale County, and the West Side of Atlanta. Okay, okay. Yeah. Then tell me, um, how has it been growing up out here in uh, Atlanta? Well, in different stages, like we were talking about before. When I first moved to Latonia, then we moved to Rockdale County. Latonia, that's yeah. crazy. How y'all say it, Latonia? <laughs> I've been saying it wrong this whole time. So <laughs> I've been saying Latonia. <laughs> <laughs> so in Rockdale County, by the time we moved there, it was still violently hands-on racist mm -hmm. like dealing with real pressure um got attacked a couple of times the education system they was literally education wise and physically holding you back mm -hmm. so it was a different experience like my mom every day after school or on the weekend she made her mission we gonna go to the city and we gonna go to our community so you can see different things that we can't see in Rockdale. And we had to build our community out in Rockdale County. So from that point, early years to early middle school, we was out there. So when we moved to Atlanta, I had my other experience. So I feel like it was pressure, but I got to see and have real experiences, like hands-on experience, how to deal with people and deal with certain situations. For yeah. real. Well, definitely yeah. shout out to your mom because she didn't have to do that. Yeah, she didn't. I could definitely tell you coming from up north, there's some people that once they get out of the community, they ain't coming back. Mm -hmm. They ain't bringing their children back, mm -hmm. nothing. Then they wonder why they, the kids grow up and they're socially awkward around certain people, don't maybe say things. It's, it's a lot of things that come from that, but that's, that's definitely dope that she took you back. You got to be able to see your community because it definitely makes you into a better person as you get older, for sure, for sure. Gives you that humility, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So definitely shout out to her for that. Um, what we all know, well, for people that don't know, you do art, clearly we do, you do art. And speaking into the influence of what you was talking about, just growing up out here, um, experiencing different both worlds and just experiencing certain things in Atlanta, can you tell me how that influenced your art, if, if it did at all? Yeah, um, my first memory was art. You know what I'm saying, uh, two years old, Gang graffiti in that in LA. Okay. So I remember the I ain't gonna say which color it was, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. But uh, we came out here, that's the first thing that she exposed us to. So she was like, I gotta do something, because not to put her business out there, she was a young mom. Mm -hmm. So she was like, I want I want I want I gotta I gotta have, I gotta do something. I don't know what to do out here. So she started doing art. Went to the west side. First place we went to was the Hammond's house. It was, was a historical art place, you know what I'm saying, for art people. Mm -hmm. And uh, driving around the city. Also, um, my dad, he was in the medical business. So he when he came down here, he's from Memphis. Was living out in LA, he went to school. When he came down here, he started doing something nobody else was doing. He was um, providing medical care, like house care, doing mm -hmm. house business, mm -hmm. to Section 8 housing, projects, low-income low neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. So For people that couldn't get out to the doctor. So like that. he was like, after school and before, I was the, I'm the youngest. So when my brother was in school, I'd be in the city with him and my mom. we go around the city and we start seeing more graffiti. That was my first memory, so I cling to it. How the words is, how the colors is, it attracted me. And I was seeing art, and when you go into an art room, you see different people in there. While I'm out in Rockdale, there ain't no intermingling. You might be cool with your teachers, but you, a, you know what I'm saying, you're a child. Mm -hmm. So, art was the first thing, subconsciously, that gave me a, a vision for a better reality, or to even have a reality to go to where you accept it, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So, it influenced me, just seeing colors in general. You know what I'm saying? Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, it sounds like it definitely was in you. Your, your mom was already into it, mm -hmm. and, and then your dad was. You got. I can see how. I can see how you are today. It's when you, you you care about your community. You can see like those things have always been present in your life because that's really dope that your father was going around helping people that couldn't have access to health care because that's something. 
I think the healthcare field itself, you to do it, you have to love it. You have to love the people. Yeah. For you to take it another step further and to just help out and reach out to a community that just talks about to the type of man that he was, and it definitely has trickled down. So yeah. I definitely see the influence on you for sure. And then you had to learn how to navigate because, like I said, bro, we in the project. We got you got to know how to how to speak. How yeah, to, how to, definitely got to know how to read the room. Man, we pulling some places, and he look at me, my brother. He was like, hey. Hop out, go find this dude. His name is this. He look like that. And we looking like nigga. What? What the fuck? What was you talking about? So we gotta get out. We gotta go around in somebody else's hood and find this person. But they helped us learn. That helped us later down the road with dealing with the situations that we, you know, what I'm saying. Right. That we was in. Exactly. Helps you. It helps you with people, man. Helps you with people. You'd be surprised how many people don't know how to deal with people. You know yeah. what I mean? So when you do, it definitely comes in handy. Yeah. Uh, Pow Wow. How'd you get the name, man? So originally, that's my granddaddy's name. Okay. So uh, my granddaddy from Memphis. Well, he's not from Memphis. He's from Mississippi. Okay. So when they moved up to Memphis, I was talking about my cousin about this last night. Both of them got middle school educations. Sharecroppers, you know what I'm saying? Started businesses. Started a restaurant out in Westwood called the Power Hour. And uh oh, okay, Power Hour restaurant. Right, so for us to stay, I still to this day ran the people. And when I tell that's my granddaddy, I had one dude start crying. Oh wow. Yeah, my, my brother ran to somebody and so many mutual links. And um he passed away and I always kept that, because that was my entrance into learning about who I am and where I'm from, mm -hmm. really, because both sides of my family come from an indigenous American background. Okay. So, you know, like being in the South and where we was, what we were dealing with, it was a constant identity structure of a struggle and crisis. Yeah, for sure. We out there, they calling us nigga, making fun of my hair, my nose, my lips. And then one time this dude attacked us. Um, another dude had to protect us. Ended up the dude to protect us. They killed his son because of, uh, I don't know if it was because of that situation, but all because we walked in the store and he was giving a service. You know what I'm saying? And that's when mm -hmm. she talks about what happened in our past slavery and whatnot. Mm -hmm. So I was clinging, when I found out those images of power, like the Black Panthers and Martin Luther King and all them, I clung to that and found like found comfort in knowing like certain background on our people. But then you learn like you always gonna say something like you ain't from you ain't from there, you ain't from this, you ain't that, you ain't African. And you just like, damn, well, I, I can't be proud of this. And so it was uh it took me a while to come back and say, My grandma told me something about our family, my granddaddy told me something about our family, but it's not the popular thing to say that your family is indigenous or you come from this. Mm. So I said, man, let me let me go back and do my own research, do my own genealogy, you feel me? And what I found was a lot of information that isn't readily available or pushed to us. Because when I started learning about my family and where we're from, I started learning about the land that's t connected to it and the land that we was pushed off of uh, why we had to move to Texarkana and then why we had to move to California and how we came back to Georgia. Before we moved back to Georgia, bro, my mom's great grandmother found out and she started crying and she said, you don't know what they do to little boys in the South. You know what I'm saying? So me um, claiming my granddad's name is a part of me, my journey coming back into who I really am and who I'm supposed mm -hmm. to be. You feel me? Cause my main thing is I want to keep on practicing and, and calling myself things when my people were successful. You know what I'm saying? As a community and as a people. I don't want to just call myself, no disrespect to people who still call themselves black or whatnot because it's all stepping stones and educating yourself. But mm -hmm. it's not the end all be all. We only been African, well, we calling ourselves African American since like 88, 89. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? And that was a small group of people that liked that. A lot of people didn't like that, but we just ran with it. So, the name Pow Wow, man, it's a responsibility to myself to keep on educating 
myself and my family on, you know what I'm saying, who he is. Okay. Yeah. Word. So it's definitely like, it's like the, the it's definitely the, the chain. It's like if the missing chain link, it links everything together. It keeps everything going. keeps everything flowing. I like that you have something that it's a singular singular thing that encompasses everything. Like mm -hmm. it gets everything explained and you can pass it on, keep passing it on, keep passing it on. Because one thing they, they definitely deprive us of is the information. You know what I mean? Information, information, information. Um, and what you're saying, indigenous, that's definitely... You're going through a whole bunch of things at that point, but definitely when it comes to finding out who you are, where you come from, that's a lot. So I definitely, I like that, man. Appreciate you sharing that with us, man, mm -hmm. for real. Um, getting back to the art, what came first? Was it painting, pencil, uh, sp spray painting? What, what, what was your first outlet for art? I think it was, the first thing was paint, so. Okay. My mom started painting first because, I like, like I said, she went. She needed to. She needed to get her hands on something. She needed to do something. Mm -hmm. So when she started painting, I was at the house. My brother was at school, so I was like, I want to paint. It got on her nerves, but she let me sit down. First thing I ever painted was a was a green Cadillac with a gold eagle sitting on top of it. <laughs> and she tells me she was like, man, this boy ain't never gonna do art because this shit sucks. <laughs> <laughs> but um. I would come to it back and forth. I'd put it down, I'd come back to it, I would doodle. And then um, it wasn't until 10th or 11th grade where there was this rapper. Well, first of all, Killer Mike got a huge influence on the city and me, because I was the first, I was first person I seen that made me um, want to be smart. Like, it was cool to be smart when I seen it. Before that, I would hide it. Because they was, you know, if he was smart, they would separate you putting different. Right. I want to be with my friends. Right. But he signed a dude that, well, he put. I don't know if he signed to put on this dude named Pill Forty One Eighty from Fourth Ward, which is down the street from my neighborhood, the neighborhood I lived, lived in Atlanta. Mm -hmm. So I was like, man, I was infatuated. Dude was smart. You know, what I'm saying good rapper. I think he spoke at the Geneva Convention or something like that against okay. gentrification. So I was like, man, I want to do something. So I painted a picture of him. And uh, my brother was like, you should get at him. And I was like, what? What you talking about? He said, holla at him on Twitter. I was like, bro, I don't even got a Twitter. I ain't no, I ain't no internet dude. I ain't no social media dude. Mm -hmm. So I was like, man, make you a Twitter and holla at him. So I did. I didn't get a reply. And I was like, bro, I did the painting. He going to see me. So we figured out he was doing an event at the New Era store. So I said, we going to pull up. I got two friends in Fort Worth at the time. Uh, Maverick and Jesse. Jesse from Pink City. Maverick stayed over in... Um, I think off Urban Street. So he pulled up and I walked up to him with the painting. He was like, bro, this is amazing. Thank you. I love you. He signed it for me. And I was like, this is crazy. Like, he, like he, he literally went crazy. I'm like, bro, why didn't he hit me up? My brother was like, you check your DMs? And I was like, nigga, what is a DM? I didn't even know. He hit me up. And he was like, I love it. This is beautiful. I've never seen it. And I was just like, man, this is, this is, this is crazy. Um, I want to keep on having this feeling. So I found a gallery in Fort Ford. And I was like, I'm gonna put it in the gallery. So I went to him and uh, it was in the gentrified area of Fort Ford at the time. And uh, they was like, yeah, whatever we make off it, we're gonna take 50%. And I was like, damn, I don't even think about it. <laughs> I was like, oh, okay. Oh. But I, I was like, I guess that's how art world is. He said, we'll contact you in two days because they was having a gallery. Mm. And uh, they didn't hit me up for two weeks. So I was like, damn, I'm 15. So I, I went over there. They was like, oh yeah, we got your painting. And they didn't go on the floor. They went in the closet, brought my painting out. It had paint splattered over it, all mm. this other stuff. So I'm, just, I'm not used to people disrespecting me like that. I got two older brothers and the type of people that I hung around, it just went in, yeah. that wasn't in my wheelhouse. So I waited a couple nights and I got some things together. And I went to my oldest brother. I said, hey, can you give me a ride down the street? We gotta go, we gotta go do something real quick. And he's like, what you trying to do? And I told him the plan. <laughs> and he was like, bruh, sit down. We not doing that, you like you crazy? And he gave me a whole, he gave me the whole big brother speech. 
And I act like a straight up little brother. I said, man, if I, if I can't handle it how I want to handle it, I ain't doing art no more. So I didn't pick painting back up until a year and a half ago. And so I had a whole lot of experiences after that, man, that I feel like needed to happen in order for me to come into my style, come into myself, mm -hmm. and know how I want to present myself. So even though I didn't like it, and I'll never do business with those people again, they, they, they still gonna have to see me and deal with me. Mm -hmm. I don't care how long it's been, they disrespect me. <laughs> you got right that wrong. You got they, right that wrong. They disrespect me, they still got to deal with me. So, but in a, in a weird way, it needed to happen. Okay, and do you have like a, I always ask artists, um, do you have like a particular setup that you like to have before when you're doing your art? Like, do you like to have the music blaring? Do you like it to be silent? Do you like do you like to be by yourself? Do you like this to pour yourself up a drink? Do you like to roll up something like, or do you just you can just paint and do your art whenever? Like, what what makes you most comfortable when you're doing your art? Man, I live in a shotgun house, like a real deal. Southern shotgun house. You well, you, so you guys, so for me, being from up north, I, don't, I have no idea what okay. a shotgun house means. So, a shotgun house is from, from that wall to that wall outside is the house. Okay. That's the kitchen right there. This is my room. So, a studio. I guess they want to, bro, I, in two jumps, I can reach anywhere in my house. You know what I'm saying? So. <laughs> in two jumps. So, um. And before that, um, I was slick. We were slick homeless. You know what mm -hmm. I'm saying? So it never even dawned to me about studios. Cause like I said, I started a year and a half ago. I ain't know nothing about no studio. Mm -hmm. And I put I put paint out for ten plus years, bro. When I paint, I put it on the wall or the floor. Cause it's something I gotta do now. As a career, it's something I gotta do. So I might turn on music, but it's a family in the shotgun house. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? So I just can't have my music playing when I'm when I'm when I'm working, or I can't be like, y'all need to be quiet. I need to have my personal space. Even though they tell me to do that, I'm not gonna do that. Mm -hmm. So I'm still figuring out what do I want for the next step to be. Mm -hmm. Like how do I want my space to be built? Because I'm painting in some circumstances that I thought was regular for all artists, but apparently it ain't. I be feeling like JJ from Good Times sometimes, bro. Like, you know, <laughs> how he was an artist, bro, I be painting a, a full shootout, somebody outside arguing. Mr. A dude come over and ask me, do I need to cut the grass? You know what I'm saying? The dog wanna be laid up with me? It's a lot of, it's, it's a lot, but. That gotta influence the art. Yeah, it, it do, cause I had to find comfort and discipline in it. I really had to organize my time, like, okay, so I guess getting up early, you know what I'm saying? Having a set time when I eat, except I don't, I don't watch TV like that. When I do, I, I watch anime. Because got to, I mean, you gotta do that. Yeah, I tell everybody, gotta watch anime. Yeah, you gotta have time for the anime. The story building, the lessons that you learn from it. Like, so I, I might watch that at a certain time. It's, it's organized how I got to do everything. It's not just not free flowing. Yeah, I mean the idea is free flow. Outside, when I when I stop doing art, but just organizing my space and have I gotta have common. We have good communication in the house because it's so close. Like yo, we gotta keep it clean. We gotta respect the space and. We gotta respect each other so we can all do our work because it ain't just about me doing the artwork. It's about they both got jobs, they both got you know what I'm saying stuff to do. So it just it's being organized and having good communication. You know what I'm saying? I can work in any environment. I feel like. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let's talk about uh, the painting behind us. Um, war over ball, ball over war. Can you explain uh, the 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 inspiration behind the painting and, and the why? Okay, so uh, this is the character that really put me on put me on deck for people to be paying attention to me. It's, uh, it's a character called Booger Bear. So the story behind Booger Bear is one night I had a real vision 
and it was an evil spirit in my room and something was telling me how to get it out. I'm not gonna get really too deep into it, but when I shook out the vision, my mentor taught me, yo, when you do your research, when you, when you see something, write it down and do your research and look into it. And when I looked into it, I found something called booger mask. So a booger mask was used by the Annie Weha, the Annie Weha people. Mm. And what they used those for was um, to, uh, to signify these people who were invading their lands. So they made some masks to mimic how they looked and they would do certain dances to show them how they was raping and pillaging the people of the villages. Mm. So I was like, okay, that's what I was, that's what I was doing in the vision. I don't know why they came and showed me that, but okay. And then later down the, down the line, I started looking at um, some videos and some pictures of a group called the Low Lifes up in um, New York in the Northeast that was stealing all the polo and all the Ralph Lauren out the, out the uh, Macy's and whatnot. Mm. And it made me look at the Ralph Lauren better. And then I got turned on to Mad Lib, listening to Freddie Gibbs, and I seen the Quasimodo character. So I was like, those are some simple but significant characters i need one but it needs to represent me and so that's when i came up with booger bear so for this one like you said it says the world of ball ball over war um the ancient games of the americas used that rubber ball so to get to that rubber ball you gotta get to the rubber tree plant so you gotta have a you gotta have a relationship with nature in order to play this game they use this game to um handle disputes, build community, and like a substitute for war. So that's a part of us. So when you think about basketball, that's a part of our culture because we dominate it. You feel what I'm saying? Right. But now, it's like they farming little kids to get them ready to get turned down for the NBA. Only like a small percentage of people of us actually make it to the NBA. Real small. So we fighting over resources to be seen, to be a player, not to own the game, own to be a player. We we literally killing each other for the resources to be seen, have that. So one dude might be a millionaire, but these other kids wasted, not not wasted, let me not say wasted, spent a majority of their time, their lives, learning how to play a game that they can never play. They don't know how to be a referee. They don't know how to do no sports management, you feel me? Nothing about the health. They don't know nothing but to be a player. So now they out in the wind. So that's what this means, the war over the ball, the ball over the war. It can be used for like a community building because, you know, in basketball, when you get that ball in your hand, you got to pass it to another player that you believe in, that mm. can lead you. Mm. You got to choose a leader. You got to come together as a team. You got to tap into your subconscious because you can't really think while you're on the court like that. You got to go off your senses. You got to tap into another essence of yourself. So there's parts of it that's beautiful and that we need but when it's in the hands of somebody else, it gets abused and we get abused. You see what I'm saying? So, um, I don't know if you've ever seen that picture of Muhammad Ali, when he has the arrows in him. Mm -hmm. So I drew from that. Um, and you see, that, see those two snakes? So it's him trying to escape the attack and turning into the beast. Cause you know, you a beast on the court, you a monster. Mm -hmm. that's, that's a man. And you know, L is an old term for God. Nah, I didn't know that. Yeah, L is an old term for God. So, and it's also a title of um, some indigenous people in America use for themselves to show their attachment. So, yeah, bro, this this one I, I wanted to show that. Nah, that's dope, bro. We can be, explanation. Yeah, we can be in control, but we gotta know who we is, and don't take nothing for granted. Like these games ain't game, ain't just games. You see what I'm saying? Time Magazine, let's get into that, man. How does it feel to be featured in Time? Crazy, because it didn't even kick in until I almost lost the opportunity. Uh, it's like, like I said, I've been a year and a half, and when I got my, my other mentor, we met, he just kept on looking at me, he said, I'm gonna have something for you, and it took like a couple of weeks. And basically, he was like, bro, I need you to do a lifetime's worth of work within two months. And he explained to me the opportunity, which is Time Magazine, and I had to go to work. 
I had to make like 30, 40 pieces within two months. Dang. And then for the piece I had to submit, it wasn't coming together. So he was like, um, hey bro, if you can't get up here by tomorrow at 12, I'm gonna pick somebody else. And I was like, don't worry about it, I got it. Nigga, I walked in that house, I started painting with my feet, bro. I went to work. <laughs> it and, sounds like it. Yeah, I had to paint something real quick. People was like, plug the hair dryer, use it so you can dry the paint quicker. I was like, cool. Plug the blow dryer up, bro. The whole house went out, no electricity. I was like, what the? F I almost started crying. Sacrifice. Yeah. No, you make a sacrifice at but this it, point. It came back home, but long story short, but it, it feels I never had this type of experience, and I'm a real private person. Mm. So having this type of platform and having people hit me up, it's, it's, it's a lot. Yeah, bro, it's a lot. It's a lot. It's a lot. Lot. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. I can, I can see it. I can, I can see you thinking about it like, yo, it's, it's really getting crazy out here. It's nah, cool, though. It's, it's what cool. you want, man. It's yeah, what you have to have. For and sure. I get a lot of different people hitting me up and having conversations with me. Oh, one thing I always want to ask about is uh, mental health. Um, can you tell me your definition of mental health and how you keep your mental health on the up and up? Okay, so. Um, my mentor was a spiritual healer. I met him, the year I met him, I lost like eight people, five of them from violence. And the day that I met him, I was going to a lecture because I got really interested in science, health. Uh, my cousin was murdered in front of his family. So I was thrown off, I had to go see the family. And I, had, I spent $80 on a lecture, I'm like, I'm gonna go see the lecture. Mm -hmm. So I went there and he went out there and he spoke. So I was just like, bro, let me just holler at him. I come from a real spiritual background because of my people. Mm -hmm. So I'm tapped into certain things and certain things are presented to me that I didn't understand because I didn't, I wasn't coached, I wasn't educated on it. I just experienced it. So some told me just to go holler at him. And he was like, bro, stop. I can see something, there's something with you and on you. Call my number. Cause he was, he didn't want to talk to me because people pay him, like you no know saying, thousands of dollars to have sessions and, and do certain things with him. Mm. He's like, bro, call me. I'm gonna charge you twenty dollars and we gonna talk. So I was like, man, I was like, I ain't gonna lie. He said twenty dollars. I was like, nigga, I ain't giving me nothing. I'm, like, I'm trying to give you nothing. Yeah, I'm like, bro, I was like, I was like, oh man, this dude, he one of them. This nigga roll his eyes in the back of his head and say something, but. We got talking on the phone, we got speaking on the phone. And he started telling me things about myself. I started telling him things about himself. And we was like this instantly. And it wasn't much like, you gotta do this, you gotta jump on your leg three times, spin and hold this leaf in your hand. He taught me how to communicate with, and not communicate with, with the beings that were communicating with me, how to get organized, how to be a man, he taught me how to be a well-rounded man and how to look back into my family, trace, trace um, generational curses, all that. I had to, look, I had to, I had to do an in-depth look into myself and what's going on. That was my form of therapy. My brother got traditional therapy from a, from a, from a dude, from my from brother, John Brown South Projects, mm. who went those experiences. So I got both sides of it. When I got to meet him, he said three words that changed my life. You see what I'm saying? But, but um, looking into yourself is the best form of mental health. But at the same time, like I, I told you before, we had this con before we got this had this conversation. Mental health, as far as us. us they treat it like it's a buzzword. You know what I mean? Like the substance that's supposed to come with it isn't there. So like with the water boys, for example, people come to Atlanta and treat them like a like a like a side show. You know what I'm saying? Like like a freak show. Mm -hmm. They'll look at them, pull their cameras out and laugh. And you in a city where we have a high rate of homeless black families, homeless black teenagers. Uh, sex trafficking, human trafficking, and these boys got to stand on a, on an exit with thousands of people coming to ridicule on them, making fun of them, pulling their phones out, 
And then somebody turns around and said, y'all need some, y'all need to check on your mental health, y'all therapy. What? What's the outlets? I'm a provider for myself and my family. I gotta sell do dollar bottles of water. Do y'all really care about us? Like when you look at rappers, they want to tell rappers to get therapy, but then you go ask them to do a song in front of thousands of people talking about killing somebody else's friend they sell, and, they, and having their friends get killed. Repeatedly, that's a ritual. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. You don't want them to grow, and when they grow from that, you don't say nothing. Um, MC Hammer, we talk about how niggas make fun of how he went broke. He spends money on his people. Uh, people say beat the pot like uh, Tina Turner, right? Tina Turner, I turn. She got beat by her dude re relentlessly. Michael Jackson, Michael Jackson was always a joke in my lifetime of living. How he looked, calling him a child molester up until he died. So y'all not taking care of us as children, as entertainers that give you everything that stand for you. I don't have no reason to do art or get there because y'all not helping me. Y'all not y'all not having y'all not building an environment for me to feel safe. So why should I even do art? You know what I'm saying? Why do I put myself out there? And it's because I'm supposed to. Like I'm supposed to create. God told me to do this. So like mental health for me is knowing that I gotta know myself and be myself. And be enlightened so I can be somebody else's light that ain't got it. You feel me? Because they not giving us a environment to feel and be safe in. It's it's a must. I gotta have that physical well being, bro. So mental health is everything, but they gotta understand what we going up against. It's not as easy as saying somebody needs therapy. Because Word. nigga, when I go back into the world, I'll be in time every month. Nigga, I still can't get no service while I'm walking to some stores. I still got to worry about what colors I'm wearing. You feel me? All that. There's so much we still got to worry about, man. So mental health is important, but they don't understand mental health. Got to deal with you, too. It's not just me. It's my whole community and who, and who I deal with. And if and if that ain't right, ain't no amount of therapy going to help. You know what I mean? Or, mm -hmm. or definitely. I definitely see what you mean with you saying that mental health is a buzzword. kind of is like trendy. I was talking to my boy about that earlier. It's like people are kind of playing mental health, kind of like playing games with it, just trying to get some clicks or trying to say it just to maybe get a couple of days out of work, mm. something like that. Yeah. And um, yeah, it's, it, I never even thought of the water boys of Atlanta like that. So yeah. I appreciate you sharing that with us. Fortunately, guys, we got we to cut it a little short. Um, this is a dope interview though. Um, again, it's, uh, this is Savas on TV, but that's my boy Pow Wow on here. Uh, but what can we, before we wrap it up, can you tell everybody, all your new fans, where they can find you at and what to look forward to? What's what, uh, anything that's coming up? Uh, any moves that's getting made, you know, along with the Time Magazine? Didn't even get get into the book that you wrote, but- uh, We can do a part two. Yeah, we definitely got to do a part two. Um, so, uh, just tell us about that, man. Tell, tell, tell us everybody where they can find you, where you uh, follow you, all that good stuff. On uh, IG, um, Ken Folk Art, K E N F O L K Art. And then my website, which has all my social media, all my links, Ken Folk Art 678. Um, big rollout with Time Magazine right now, going to be in the coffee to the anniversary coffee table book coming out in November. Um, the art show is also in November. And, uh, getting some gallery things ready for so just if y'all stay on beat with me with the um on the websites and the ig pretty much know everything i'm gonna be having coming up so yeah. okay man we're looking forward to it bro looking forward to it it's another episode of time to be i'm your host ab Brizzly. we out peace